This is a show about authentic, deep connection to the liminal spaces. Join me and my guests as we explore the boundaries between the expected and the unexplained, between the living and the dead, between heaven and earth, between everyday life and the initiation into the unseen realms. Welcome to Mysteries, Graveyards, and the Human Psyche. I'm your host, Melissa B. In this episode... That's one of the best things about being comfortable in cemeteries and other sacred spaces, just to appreciate them for what they are, enjoy your time there, but don't feel like you need to take anything away from it. Leave pieces there for other people to discover. If you ever go to Sleepy Hollow, New York, and to the Sleepy Hollow Cemetery, there you will find the final resting place of the father of the American ghost story, Washington Irving. If you go to his family plot, you'll notice that his headstone is larger and rounder than the headstones around him. This is not because he wanted to stand out. This is because it's the third version of his headstone. The first two were completely destroyed by souvenir hunters who chipped away at his grave until there was nothing left. For those of us who are tour guides in the cemetery and for the people who love Washington Irving and appreciate the importance of cemeteries in particular, we hope that this is the third and final version of his headstone. Believe it or not, people often go into a cemetery and believe that they can take things with them. And people also believe that when they go to land, that they can just claim that land. Here to talk about some of these really scintillating topics with us is Karen Fraser. She's a researcher, an amateur historian, a cemetery tour guide, a photographer of cemeteries, and an all-around good auntie. She is the type of person who, everywhere she goes, she makes friends, and her family is just truly the human family. Welcome, Karen. I'm so delighted to have you on my show. Could you please talk a little bit about some of the controversy surrounding grave rubbings? Grave rubbings are cool. I'm not going to I'm not going to diss that. Certainly grave rubbings certainly look cool if you visit the uh, historical society serving Sleepy Hollow in Terrytown. They do have some very old like 1900 1901 grave rubbings of some of the stones in the churchyard. But so many people visited Katrina Van Tassel's gravestone and so many people did grave rubbings of her stone that her stone is almost completely gone at this point. If the name Katrina Van Tassel sounds familiar to you, that's because it's from The Legend of Sleepy Hollow by Washington Irving. The red sandstone that her stone is made of Of course, sandstone has layers to it. So what ends up happening is it just kept peeling. Like pieces just kept peeling off because the pressure and and the the damage of the crayon back and forth across the surface turned it into just these little flakes of artwork that are left. If you visit Katrina's stone at this point, it's mostly concrete. And then they just have the artwork that's left and the wording that is left stuck to the concrete is not the whole stone anymore. Um, and you can see what her stone would have looked like by looking at her husband Petrus's stone, which is right next to it. It seems so strange to us in this era of litigation that an author would hear a name and like the sound of it so much that he created a character from that name. And that's why Katrina Van Tassel's headstone has been just as vandalized as Washington Irving's has been. Her husband Petrus and his cousin Cornelius, both of them fought on the American side uh, uh, during the war against the British. And both of them spent, I think about a year um, in one of the British prisons in Manhattan. And their wives, Elizabeth and Katrina, had to 
keep things together in the Tarkytown Sleepy Hollow area, which was a really rough place to be during the Revolutionary War because it was between what the soon to be Americans controlled, the soon to be US controlled, and the British. Um, so that was a really rough place to be. A lot of raids on the farmhouses, a lot of, you know, the, the British soldiers would set people's houses on fire or their barns, take their cattle. Probably slaughter the cattle for food and feed their soldiers with the, your cattle. And Well, yeah. Oh, well, a lot of times what they would do is they would come up to Westchester County and they would just take the cattle and and herd them back down to Manhattan to feed people. Um, so yeah, that's one of the things, they, they like, and it, of course, very common wartime activity of stealing what you need. And it's a good thing that Petrus's headstone is still standing intact because we can actually get a better idea of what Katrina's headstone would have looked like before all of this irreversible damage was done to it throughout the centuries. So it's really terrible that her stone is in such awful shape. And it's just because her name, I mean, it's not even spelled the same, but her name is the same as the story character. That's the reason why, like I said, gravestone rubbings are cool, but don't do them. <laughs> Take a picture. You can manipulate a picture in your computer. You can make it look like a gravestone rubbing. You can even take the image that you photographed and you can take it to a maker space and you can carve it into a piece of slate if you want to. Um, you can have all kinds of fun with the image that you take. But if you do these rubbings where you take the big piece of newsprint and the side of a crayon or the side of a charcoal and you do these rubbings, the damage that is done to these stones is irreparable and in a lot of instances especially for women back from that period and earlier or even well into the 50s um women didn't own property didn't own businesses for the most part so there's not this long paper trail of being able to study a woman's history when you go back to that period um other than, hey, there's a gravestone and it gives the, the date of birth and the date of death and maybe a little bit of more information on it. Um, so preserving these stones, I think, is really important. Yes, it seems that desecrating land, sacred land for burying and just sacred land and holy places is something that is rife in our culture. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I mean, we talked about that earlier where we talked about how, you know, the sac sacred lands of of indigenous people being taken, being taken from them, being turned into something else in order to have an, just another way of erasing what's important to a different people, you know, take taking sacred things like that, um, even go you know cemetery say people going into cemeteries today what, what do i like to say like something that's not if it's not screwed down somebody's going to take it um like washington irving being such a popular author when he died that people would come to the cemetery because they didn't you know they didn't come to take a picture they didn't have a camera so they would chip little pieces off of his gravestone to take home as a memento. It's like, I, 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 got, I got this. You get enough people doing that, of course, they whittle the stone down to nothing and the family replaces the stone and people keep doing it. They just keep chipping pieces off of it and taking pieces with them. But people do that still today when there are discoveries of you know, places where people have either lived or the dead have been buried. If people find something that they consider of value, they will just take it. And these things end up in private collections. These things end up in museums and it's not right. I mean, I wish that people could just leave things where they see them and not have to take everything. But we've all been raised under this capitalistic assumption that everything belongs to somebody like something can't belong to everybody for some reason unless it's 
something that's not ours in the first place, like in like national parks or national forests. Um, I mean, even if you go back to the destruction of the the burying ground for the enslaved people on Phillipsburg Manor, somebody needed to own that property apparently, so that made it okay for them to just go ahead and bulldoze it because you know they didn't think it was important to them. It was important to someone else, but eh, whatever. So they just went ahead and sold it off as if it was, you know, not important. There is now a project in its early stages to create a plaque or some kind of a memorial um, near the burying ground where the enslaved African people lived and loved and suffered and worked and died. Yeah. You know, it, well, it's, it, it's not like we all have ancestors to look up to. I mean, there's certainly, it's, there's, there's not good people in lots of different places. And that doesn't mean that we are bad, mm-hmm. um, but it's something that we need to be, I don't know, think about and be aware of because that is part of our past. Mm-hmm. And to be honest about it and to do the work to come out of the other end of that garbage in your past and to make yourself a better person in the work that you do and the things that you that you are going to show the most energy towards Mm -hmm. um because it is it's it's important that that we know where we come from and it's not always the perfect place that we would like to think it is and there are certainly ancestors who don't deserve the reverence that we might give other ancestors um but to learn from what they did and to stop the cycle of that i think is the most important thing um to to, you know you know because we talk about like what you know like whitewashing history and how Mm -hmm. history is written by the people who write the books um and it's from their perspective and we miss out on so much that way um Mm -hmm. that you know research and being able to go back and look at things and trying to figure out i mean even if even if we do research we have to make sure that what we're researching is true. Um, there's always been a lot of disinformation. There's always been a lot of whitewashing of historical, you know, elements of things that have happened. I mean, what even we with, get is the history of the ruling class when we learn course. about history in school. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Well, even even if like even if you look at like the Italian railroad workers and how much trouble I had trying to figure out what their names actually were because nobody cared enough to make sure they were spelling them right. Karen solved a mystery, y'all. Listen. It's 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 fun that, you know, I was able to stumble on this, actually. Um, for, for a couple of years, I was a research assistant in the Sleepy Hollow Cemetery office. Um, and spending some time with the old ledger books. And I had heard heard from folks both at the Sleepy Hollow Cemetery and from the Historical Society serving Sleepy Hollow Terrytown that there had been, during the time of the railroad expansion up the Hudson River from New York City, um, there had been an explosion during um, some of the train track construction. And most of the... Uh, men who were working that job were Italian immigrants. M- many of them did not even speak English. Um, a whole flatbed train car exploded. And this all happened in May of 1891. Now, most of the men were part of a group of Italian uh, immigrants who lived in Port Chester. Many of these men did not have family in town. Um, many of them had family back in Italy and they were sending money back when they, when they had it to help out their families. So when this explosion happened and the guy who kept track of all of their, their work, um, his notebook 
had the information in it about all of these guys who wore they had to wear a brass number plate that's how they kept track of them on the payroll they didn't even bother to learn these men's names they kept track of them by a number when the explosion happened most of these men lost their numbers so they had a hard time figuring out exactly who was dead there were a lot of newspaper articles written um that talked about the explosion and about the death of these men but the newspapers as they started figuring out what the names of these men were i kept coming across different names because they were all spelled wrong you know th that's just another way of showing that oh it's not that it's not as important you know it, you don't have to do that all correctly blah 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 um i was able to find where they were buried in the in the cemetery by accident i was working in one of the ledger books and there it was alphabetical by last name and i was looking through the letter u in the ledger book because i was just curious about like unknown burials people who were buried that didn't have a name attached to them and i came across this last name that started with a u that to me a completely uneducated person when it comes to italian the name looked italian so i was like huh so i saw where this burial was this person's burial and i looked on the map where they were and then it was like hmm, well that's in the single grave section so there's a part of the old part of the cemetery where it's all individual graves there's no family plots in that area so i look at that spot and i was like well let me see who else is in that row and i started to look at the names of the other people who were buried close to this person and it was a bunch of italian names and it was a bunch of graves that were all bought by the railroad and all of these people died on the same day i'm like oh my god i found it wow i was just so excited because you know talking to like sleepy hollow historians they're like, well, we know that they're buried here. We just don't know where. And I was able to find it and I was over the moon. I was like, here they are. So I had these newspaper articles and I had the, the handwritten old ledger book from the, from the cemetery. And I still had a hard time figuring out who was who because everybody spelled the names different. You know, like they would spell them phonetically or whatever. Right. And and out of all of these graves lined up next to each other, only one of them has a stone. So that way I could point out like, okay, here's this guy, but then there's like two more over here and the rest of them are this way. Um, so they're all buried in, in the same row together. is a photographer of cemeteries and she gave me a stack of photographs to look through in order to choose some visual images for this episode and the one that I chose is called silent but Karen has broken the silence and given these men back their identity she has become their voice It reminds me a lot of um, what you had said in the past that um, there you really die twice. You do. You die twice. Um, that that's that's a belief, and I'm not sure exactly how many different you know belief systems that we die once when our body dies. We die when we stop breathing. When our heart stops beating, we die again the last time someone thinks of us or says our name um and that was one of the best things about being a, a tour guide in the old dutch burying grounds and in the sleepy hollow cemetery was being able to keep these characters alive keep these people alive keep these little pieces of history alive by you know telling telling about them 
Um, even simple stuff like um, one of my favorite stones that um, f when I was working in this in the Sleepy Hollow Cemetery, I would always walk past Little Willie. There's a few Little Willies in the tr in in the cemetery, and Willie was a name that was popular for a while. And it was if it was a little kid that passed away, um, beautiful little stones with a lamb on top, and Little Willie. I would stop there if I needed to like pad the time or try not to bump up against another tour guide. I'd stop and talk about Little Willie and, and talk about, you know, when children died, you know, this, this was a common art motif for a while doing this lamb on top of the stone. And, you know, this is back when, you know, we didn't have vaccines and we didn't have penicillin and we didn't have all these things that keep people alive now. Um, and if you think about dying twice when you're little like that not very many people know you so there's not very many people to carry on the knowledge of your existence and so there's not people to be around to say your name again so that was my way of keeping little willie alive was to you know at least say his name i didn't know anything else about him um when I had his name and 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 his uh, his dates, and that was it. Um, so that was a way of pointing that sort of thing out to people was to stop and talk about Little Willie. Mm. And now I've become obsessed with the name Willie, and every time <laughs> I see a Willie in a churchyard or a cemetery, I have to take a picture. <laughs> Thanks, Karen, so much for your time. It's really been an amazing, illuminating, exciting conversation. What words would you leave us with? The more you learn, the more you need to ask questions. And the, and the, and the, the further into it, like it, it, everybody talks about going into the rabbit hole of doing genealogy and how that's just like the focus of like everybody's got that auntie in their family that's doing all of that and has all of the information for everybody because that's what she's been putting all of her energy into for like the last 20 years. <laughs> um, and I think that my my job is an auntie i think it's very important um because i did not have kids myself but to set myself as a as a role model of doing things differently like i think that, that that's part of that's part of of my road to becoming a good crone is being a good auntie um and being able to point out it's like well you don't have to do it this way just because that's the way your family's always done it you can do it this way instead um and yeah just keep asking questions because there's always there's always an answer out there sometimes it's just gonna take a really long time to find it <sighs> is there anybody cooler than karen i don't know <laughs> That being said, I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Mysteries, Graveyards, and the Human Psyche. I hope to see you next time for more exciting content by really cool people. As always, the music in this episode was written and performed by another really cool person, Lee Chernowitz, who gives every episode such style and class. Thank you so much. See you next time. <laughs>